Hello, my name is Chris Souten and I'll be your teacher on this course, An Introduction to Globalisation. By the end of the course, I hope to have taken you on an interesting and informative journey where you can gain a better understanding of one of the most important and influential phenomena of the past 50 years. In this first lesson, I'll begin by providing a handful of key facts about globalisation before talking about the derivation and definition of the term globalisation itself. I'll then give a more detailed overview of the course and some of the key strands of globalisation which we will be examining. I thought I'd begin by sharing five interesting facts which are the direct result of globalisation to show just how deep and far-reaching the phenomenon has been. We won't go into too much detail about these facts now, but they, and many others like them, will be explored throughout the course. <clears throat> Firstly, we can see the huge impact that globalisation has had on the world economy by the enormous increase in the volume of gold global trade. Between 1955 and 2005, global trade grew by 10,000%, 100 times, from $95 billion to a staggering $12 trillion. Secondly, technology. As noted by former US President Bill Clinton, in the 1960s, only 80 transatlantic phone calls could take place simultaneously. The technological changes of the past half century have been nothing short of miraculous. Thirdly, a cultural fact. 3.2 billion people watched at least one minute of the 2014 Soccer World Cup. This is close to half of the world's population. Fourthly, food. And more specifically, that institution which is often held up as a symbol of cultural homogenisation, McDonald's. You can now eat their food in 118 countries where any one of 35,000 outlets. And indeed, the Big Mac Index, which tracks the prices of the aforementioned hamburger in different countries, is a well-regarded economic statistic. Lastly, according to a 2010 report by the International Labour Organization, 210 million people, or nearly 4% of the world population, live outside their country of origin. In this third section, we'll try and trace the origins of the actual word globalisation. It appears to date back to the 1940s, although its early origins are somewhat unclear. What we can say for sure is that the term became popular and then ubiquitous some 50 years later in the 1990s. We won't worry too much about the etymology of the word here, save to point out two important uses that very much help to shape our later understanding of the term. The first term to consider is that of the global village, coined by Marshall McLuhan, who used it to describe a world which has been contracted into a village through technology, linked by an electronic nervous system. The second use appeared in an article by Theodore Levitt in 1983 entitled The Globalisation of Markets referring to the spread of corporations around the world, wherein he declared, gone are accustomed differences in national or regional preferences. It was this article which really brought the term to popular notice. Defining globalisation is a difficult, if not impossible, task, with so many radically different opinions about what it is and is not, about whether it is good or bad, about whether it is primarily economic, technological, cultural or political, or a mixture of all of these terms. Defining globalisation is a difficult, if not impossible, task, with so many radically different opinions about what it is and is not, about whether it is good or bad, about whether it is primarily economic, technological, cultural or political, or a mixture of all of these terms. As noted by Manfred Steger, the term has been used to describe a process, a condition, a force and an age. To understand the range of opinions about the term and what it means, let's look at three distinct definitions. The first, from the sociologist Anthony Giddens, 
provides a clear and relatively objective view of globalisation. In his 1991 Consequences of Modernity, he writes, Globalisation can thus be defined as the intensification of worldwide social relations, which link distinct localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away, and vice versa. The second definition, from the International Forum on Globalisation, is indicative of those who perceive globalisation as a nakedly aggressive economic force, saying, the present worldwide drive toward a globalised economic system dominated by supranational corporate trade and banking institutions that are not accountable to democratic processes or national governments. Robin Meredith, however, argues the opposite, arguing that globalisation is good, and not just for the rich, but especially for the poor. The booming economies of India and China have lifted 200 million people out of abject poverty, and tens of millions more have catapulted themselves far ahead into the middle class. Over this course we'll look at all the arguments, and I'll try to give you the information you need to know more about a phenomenon which is effective, directly or indirectly, nearly every human, and indeed every living creature on earth, so that you can make up your own mind. In the last part of this lesson, I'll just give you a quick summary of some of those things we're going to look at on this course. In doing so, you will also hopefully get a good overview of some of the key themes of globalisation. As noted above, globalisation is not a new phenomenon, and there have been many earlier forms of globalisation. The second lesson will look at such forms, for example, the Silk Road and the European Maritime Empires, comparing these to the form which we are experiencing in the modern world. Lessons three to eight will consider the impact of globalisation on six specific areas, namely economics, politics, culture, society, ecology and law. Many of these areas are interconnected, so there will be crossover between many of these fields. For example, China's economic growth over the past 25 or so years has resulted in a much greater political influence. The rise of English, a cultural phenomenon, has had social impacts, for example, in the way that people perceive their own identity, as well as economic impact. Businesses which are Anglophone tend to be more successful because English is the international language of trade. Lesson 9 will adopt a slightly different tack and look at the different ways in which globalisation can be measured and some of the different indices which are used. In doing so, we will also explore why some countries are more globalised than others. Lesson 10 looks at one of the most sensitive and controversial issues facing globalisation, namely, who benefits from it? From a Western perspective, the dominant narrative or paradigm of globalisation is that it is a force for good, a rising sea that floats all boats i.e. that everybody benefits, more or less, from it. However, there are many influential voices, especially from the global south, the so-called developing world, who challenge this notion. Lesson 11 examines globalisation more specifically through an academic filter, considering some of the more important and influential global globalisation theorists, including well-known writers and thinkers such as Joseph Stieglitz, and Naomi Klein. Lesson 12 will look at the different perspectives about where globalisation goes now. Will globalisation continue to thicken and become more entrenched, or will we witness a period of deglobalisation, as some argue? So I hope you enjoy the journey and look forward to being your guide into this complex but fascinating subject. See you in lesson two.